Hello, and welcome to Home Space and Reason, a podcast about creating a home that thrives. Hi there, I'm Christina Browning, your host. If you know your home could be so much more than it is, I discuss home functionality, aesthetics, and automation. I am a realtor in the Portland, Oregon area and a home functionality coach. I geek out on every subject imaginable regarding your home and yard, challenging you to think of your space differently to get the most out of every square foot. I pose questions for you to think through about your space and your reason. This podcast is all positive, offering you virtual fist bumps and celebrating the wins. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect, but you can still aim for your best every day. In this episode, let's discuss home functionality, creating dual purpose rooms and flex space. Episode 34. If you've listened from the first episode, you know I have long advocated for homes that can go the long haul and spaces that can change as your family goes through different seasons of your life. From a real estate perspective, specialty rooms in homes used to be a hook for listings. Remember the gift wrapping room? I remember rooms like this being highlights for marketing a home and sometimes would help a home sell quickly. But as we spend more time at home, efficient layouts and multi-purpose spaces are becoming more attractive to buyers. It makes no sense to create a room that is so very specific to owner A that it cannot easily be changed to appeal to owner B unless you plan to be there for your entire life and then pass the home on to your next generation. Speaking of real estate, if you happen to know someone in the market to buy or sell in the greater Metro Portland, Oregon area, kindly send them my way. The greatest compliment I could possibly receive is the confidence of your referral. Creating convertible rooms and flex spaces helps ensure you have space for whatever comes next. It's removing outdated labels like guest room or family room or formal dining room and turning them into something less insistent. But that darn formal dining room with its elongated shape and giant chandelier just demands to be called the dining room as it sits. How do you change a space from that to a flex space? So let's talk about that. In the third home that I personally owned, you walked into the house and the room to the right was a formal dining room. I never used it. Not as a formal dining room or as anything else for that matter. This was the mid-1990s and I hadn't figured out the key yet to making a home go the distance. It would have been an ideal workout space since it wasn't even in close proximity to the kitchen. If I had added a mirror down the length of it, a bar three ballet bar in the middle, um, yoga mats maybe on part of the floor, it would have been a stunning and uplifting space for workouts, getting used far more than it did. If you want your space to feel good and function well, it doesn't have to go by its original or any forever title. It can be a for now title. For now, this room will serve as our son's taekwondo studio, my yoga space, and grandpa's stretching area for physical therapy. Once our life shifts again, it will morph into whatever we need in that next phase of our life. And I don't mean retirement. I mean, whatever life brings in a couple years from now, it may be two years away or seven. That timing doesn't matter. What matters is is what used to be a formal dining room that never got used, is now getting used three times per day by three different people in your family. That is quality use of space. 
That is square footage being used to its highest potential, encouraging physical activity, passions, and well-being. Let's start with dissecting its shape. Are there any indentations or nooks in the space that would lend itself to built-in shelving or sitting areas? Is there outdated bits that just need to come down anyway for aesthetic reasons that you could clear out so you can start to envision the possibilities without the cloud of that old stuff? Getting your unused space stripped of everything not useful is a great place to start even if you don't quite have your arms wrapped around the final concept yet. Something that often gets overlooked is self-care. Read into this yoga, meditation, reading time, and space to move your body. These spaces are sometimes the easiest to incorporate into another space, in my opinion. If you're challenged, click on my website, spaceandreason.com, and click on the link, Imagine. I can help if you're stuck. I also have a Pinterest board called Dual Purpose Rooms for ideas on what others have done. I'm a visual person, and if you are too, check that out. My handle there is the same as all platforms, at Space and Reason. If you're staring at the room in question, the room that you want to be dual purposed or used more, and you don't already use it much or at all, dissect your habits in the rest of the house to figure out what you need space for. For example, if you never seem to be able to get laundry folded, like ever, is it because you don't have a surface to do the task? I fold laundry on my already made bed, But if that doesn't work for you and you don't have countertops in a laundry room for folding, maybe a task space is in order. Maybe for you, that's a large, low table of sorts, or maybe an island that could accommodate your laundry folding, your child's science projects or Lego escapades, your annual Christmas soap making project, a gift wrapping area, and your partner's bottling station for the wine that they make once a year. If this appeals to you, let's envision each task that needs to be done there and figure out how you can keep it clean and ready to use. This low table or island of sorts, does it need shelving with doors, cupboards under it so things are hidden? Do you need bookshelves or open shelving? If this is a separate space for yoga or your teens to hang, could it or should it have a mini fridge or a TV? What happens when your kids are older than they are now? Will they need homework space or will they be out of the house? What will that space be able to do for you then? If you have an idea of what that answer is, super. Maybe this island can be put on casters so it's even more mobile. Locked down when you need to use it, unlocked and rolled to a different area when it needs to go away. Mudrooms can be better thought of as all-encompassing arrival zones to handle the comings and goings of your life. This should and could be for more than just muddy boots. It's where you hang your keys, your face mask, drop mail, and even charge electronics, maybe. Depending on the size of the space, it might also be a storage space for sports gear and pet accessories like leashes, balls, and treats. Building high functionality into this area makes it work harder than ever to better handle your life. When your children are babies, there are diaper bags and car seats to manage. But as they grow, the same space should be able to flex to handle any interests they may have that need to come and go, like soccer gear and equipment, band instruments, and even crutches for when she breaks her ankle skiing. Life happens. And this area is one of the hardest working areas in your home because it's always in flux and change is constant. Two months ago, my son was in four Taekwondo classes a week. Now he's stopped in-person classes, so we've shifted to an obsession about spiders, snakes, 
and insects. Guess what's on the bench in our mudroom now? His snake catching gloves, his vented bug cage and magnifying glass because it comes inside and goes back outside about a hundred times a day now. Because we have a bench there, it handles these things. When aging parents come to live with their grown children, an adaptable living space can be beneficial here, just like it would be beneficial when young adult children return home for a long period of time. The extended family living together reflects a shift in America right now, along with housing affordability challenges and quarantine scenarios. Because many buyers lack the information to envision how flexible spaces might even be used for multiple purposes, as a realtor selling a home, I usually use small tasteful signage to list how this space could be used depending on the need, age, and interests of the potential buyers. One of my favorite concepts for making square footage go the extra mile is turning a lightly used closet into a workspace by removing the doors and painting the inside a different color, adding a desk height shelf and pulling up a chair. You'll get a kick out of this. I've seen them called a clothis, <laughs> a hybrid of closet and office. Perhaps you already have a home office, but you found that you occasionally need two workspaces when one of you needs to be on a Zoom call. The clothis can be for a while. It doesn't have to be forever. I have the most delightful friend who has two cats, but she is the opposite of a cat lady. Their home is impossibly clean and pristine. They turned a standard set of upper and lower cabinets in their home that shared a wall with their garage and reconsidered how it worked. I asked her to share the story with us. She said, we remodeled our old laundry room and made it into a pantry, but left the original sink and cabinet. It still gets used as a wash sink, like for gardening, etc. The laundry room itself was relocated upstairs into our master bath area. So this former laundry room cabinet downstairs is actually a typical laundry room sink that has two doors on the underside. We decided this would be a good access point for the kitty litter box, which is actually in the garage. Let me explain, she says. One cupboard door has a flipper pet door that we put in and our cats walk through it, entering under the sink. That in turn leads to another pet door we installed into the outside garage wall under the sink that leads to where the litter box is located in a giant Rubbermaid container on wheels. The litter box sits inside the Rubbermaid container to enclose it. The reason we made this poo poo palace, as she calls it, is so we wouldn't have to smell a cat litter box in the house or have sand kicked all over the place. Also, it allows us to bring the Rubbermaid container outside to wash and sanitize it periodically. We lift the lid off the Rubbermaid container twice daily to clean the kitty litter box, which may sound gross, but it's just like taking out the garbage after a while. Now for the most important part, training your cats to go in and out of the flipper doors to get to their potty box. Despite popular belief, cats are extremely trainable. We taught them from the time they were eight weeks old as kittens to go through the flipper doors with a food reward system, which in their case was little bits of tuna. Now as adults, they just decide when they need to go to the ladies' room and powder their nose. Thank you, Terry, for being willing to share this wonderful story of thinking through how your space could work harder for you and serve more than one purpose. Speaking of pet owners, have you seen the dog kennels that are end tables? Yes, same space used for twice the good. I've also seen a buffet-style credenza along a wall toward an entryway that had two doors with decorative screens on the front instead of solid wood or glass. They opened like an accordion to reveal two dog beds. The drawers on the left and right side of the unit pull out to reveal inset holes where the water and food bowls sit. When pushed in, the pets have access to them from inside their gorgeous kennel. From the outside, it looks like a piece of furniture. 
Would I ever recommend to put open dog beds right near the front door for guests to trip over upon entry? Nope. But would I recommend a stunning piece of dual purpose furniture there? Heck yes. Another piece of furniture that I personally own that has dual purpose is a coffee table that has a lift up top, which serves as a laptop table. It lifts up and angles out to give you additional bonus workspace. Observe yourself. What are your roadblocks in doing the things that you most enjoy? Observe your family. What are their roadblocks? Upon that reflection, I noticed that one of my roadblocks I was experiencing in fully enjoying homebrewing kombucha was the space to easily access my supplies. Turns out simply adding another shelf in the unused vertical space in our entry closet was the ideal solution in making a space to brew because technically... When I really looked at what was going on, I had room in my kitchen for the act of brewing and flavoring, but nowhere for the fermentation process to happen, which is like seven days long, and I didn't want all of that sitting out on my counters. Once I dissected it, I realized we had the space we needed if I looked at our unused vertical space inside our closet. This often happens when you enjoy nine-foot ceilings but the door heights are not higher than normal, so the wasted vertical space in the closets are obscene. If any of you builders out there would like me to walk your spec home and make tweaks to it so it functions better, which leads to happier buyers, just say the word. I would love to work through your floor plan and its functionality. What if you have a massive master bedroom that you only use for sleeping and you long for a sewing room. Maybe your guest room is next to your giant master bedroom. What if you made the master bedroom the sewing room and the guest room the new smaller master bedroom? I have friends that did this very thing. Sure, it's lovely to have a big master bedroom, but only if you use all of it. If you find yourself longing for more space and you're simultaneously wasting space by letting it sit unused, consider swapping spaces or adding fold-down desks or sewing platforms. This is more about introspection than anything. What if you love music, like so much? Imagine you have a little indentation, a few feet in the wall, an alcove of sorts. Could you put a wall-mounted credenza there with a turntable or a built-in scenario to also hold all your albums? If you added a few comfy chairs and a fabulous desk, you might be able to combine a home office and a music room into one space. Your art could literally be album covers. I recommended this to a family that lives in Bend, Oregon. The couple met over their love of music, and album covers make great art. Alternately, one wall can be your music wall if you have an open floor plan. Leith and Lisa have a feature wall running parallel from their kitchen to their dining room and connecting to their sliding door to the back patio. That wall ultimately was home to the turntable and open shelving for featuring the albums. Ever-changing and always awesome, this is something I have often admired. It's a nod to their mutual love of music and it can change based on their mood. Because it occupies a wall in the main living space, parties are wonderful because guests can peruse their collection and put on the next request. Maybe you have an unfinished basement and you're considering finishing it, but how? These days, I would advise against carpet since it's not pet friendly and moisture or floods can happen in basements. 
polished and stained concrete is about as all-purpose as it gets for resale. If you want a comfy space there, throw a rug into the area and you've made it warmer and cozier. But in a resale scenario, this space can flex to be storage, a workout zone, an art space, bonus points if there's a drain in the floor, or it can even be a play zone for kids. It could be a CrossFit area for workouts if there's enough headroom or a space to build a business before leasing a real space. Finishing your basement easily doubles the amount of marketable square footage in your home. It easily and affordably creates flex space, costing a third to half of what it would take for above ground construction to add on. The most important bits are drywall and lighting here, so it feels like a space you want to be in, so you can envision what comes next. Lighting is always the most important part, and sometimes this can be challenging in a basement. Finishing a basement requires emergency escape and rescue openings. Your first step in this process of thinking it through is to check local building codes. Bob Vila has a great article on this that I'll include in the podcast notes. Next, let's whittle things down and talk about some dual-purpose miniature concepts for a second. When my son loses a tooth, the tooth fairy brings him something for his fairy garden, along with a sparkly, glitter-covered $1 bill. So he has a magical fairy garden, and when we constructed our hammock cabana outdoors to occupy a small, unused space in our already small yard, we knew we wanted to add in a mounted planter, specifically to grow Mexican cigar plants, which have historically attracted hummingbirds to our yard. This means lots of action to watch whilst lying in the hammock. Here's where the dual purpose bits come in. Planning this space and leaving extra room for his fairy garden allows the garden to be higher for him to enjoy and see it. Bonus points that has gone the extra mile in being the burial site for his pet fish recently. The opposite end of the hammock cabana has two shelves mounted. One at countertop height so we can pull up bar stools during our backyard parties, and alternately we can feature a drink station here with wine, glasses, and lemon water. When we're home alone, we stack it with blankets, whatever book we're reading, and our Bluetooth speaker. It goes the extra mile because we considered all the ways in which we might possibly use it before we built it. Another small bit of minutiae in the dual purpose category, we have built-ins on either side of our fireplace. Nine months out of the year, the shelf closest to the fireplace simply houses a stack of birch wood for aesthetic purposes. I love birch wood. Having grew up in the Midwest, it reminds me of my childhood. And somehow, despite our fireplace being a gas fireplace, the ever-present stack of wood there makes it feel more homey. But hello, February. When the holidays are over and growing seeds is on my mind... I have a flush mount grow bar attached to the top of this particular built-in. The wood gets invited to live in the garage for three months, and this exact space is the new home to my indoor greenhouse until spring arrives and I can move my seedlings outdoors. It fascinates my son, and he often helps me water the new seedlings. When the weather is still cold, it gives me something to obsess over and check on often. What lights me up is that this space is just 16 inches deep and 30 inches wide, but it does so very much and alternates depending on the time of the year. Recently, I saw a post someone shared on our Home Space and Reason group page That's a custom dining room table in which the slats come off the top to reveal a sunken area underneath to hold puzzles or games. There are people who love puzzles but simply don't have the space to have large complicated puzzles sitting out for long periods of time because those puzzles can take weeks to finish. So in this instance, the dining room table has instantly become the game room. And because it's dual-purposed in a practical way, 
it counts. They can literally put the top slats back on and sit there to eat. Now let's get to the questions to ask yourself about your home space and your reason. Get a piece of paper and put this at the top. Things I wish I had space for and leave it out for the next week or more. As you encounter frustrations, examine what could help alleviate the frustrations and how you could tweak a space to better accommodate this. I'm asking you to leave it out because some things just don't come to mind immediately. Sometimes as you move throughout your house and you go through your routines, that's when things occur to you. Question number two, how much wasted vertical space do you have that could be used better? Look up. Consider adding another shelf in your coat closet. Consider adding dropped shelving in your garage. Before putting these things in, decipher what the tallest thing is that you need on that shelf and then mark where you'll place the next shelf. Question number three. If you have a newer built home and you see any outlets capped, investigate what's under the cap. Let me tell you why. In our mudroom, inside the bench, was a capped outlet. I'm sure the foreman was thinking, no one is plugging a lamp in the mudroom bench which has a lid. But I invited the foreman back to open it up later and made it a functional outlet because there's no greater space to charge our lawnmower, leaf blower, and hedge trimmer battery than there, out of sight and organized. This space does more than just hold shoes. It holds and hides our charging station for all the lawn equipment. Because it's just inside the door from the garage, it's also sheltered from the heat and the cold. Question number four. Ask yourself, where do I have room to spare? And where are we super tight on space? See if there's parallels. There are situations that the spaces that have room to spare might compensate for the rooms where you're bursting at the seams. And I'll give you an example. We have a ridiculously large master bedroom closet, but we are so tight on space in our garage because we park both vehicles there too. We shifted our suitcases from the garage to the master bedroom closet because let's face it, when we travel, we haul them up to our closet to pack anyway. So think about what fills the tighter spaces and what spaces you have extra room in and see if it makes sense to shift some things so that spaces work harder for you. Our master bedroom now does not just hold clothes, but it holds relevant things related to clothes and it alleviates our garage situation. Question number five, when guests come over, do you have an extra spot for them to sit? And if the answer is currently no, consider adding seating that includes storage inside. When purchasing anything, think, Can this do two things for me? And if not, is there another option that could? Question number six. What side of your house is the most inaccessible on the exterior? And if you never use it, could you plant something there that would at least be a visual pleasure and maybe smell amazing if you opened that window facing that side? That makes the space less wasted and more of a pleasure from inside your home. Lastly, question seven. Is there something you could simply add casters to that would multiply its use? Perhaps a small kitchen island with lockable casters could be unlocked and wheeled to become a giant workspace for the new line of soap you're making. Maybe you wheel it into the main space for a special project or as additional serving space at Thanksgiving when you're passing out hors d'oeuvres. Maybe it's a third bunco station when the ladies come over for cards. Casters can make a normal thing multi-purpose really quickly. 
positive self-talk takes practice if it's not your natural instinct or if it's not something you learned from your parents. If you're generally more pessimistic, you can learn to shift your inner dialogue to be more encouraging and uplifting to yourself. But forming a new habit takes time and effort. Over time, if you work on it, your thoughts can shift. Positive self-talk can become your norm. What is your mantra this week? I am strong. I will create a life I can be proud of. I will create a home that thrives. Everything is connected. Everything. So everything is worth slowly considering how you spend your minutes at home, whether it's in frustration or in joy, adds up to hours, days, months, and a lifetime. So the quality of your minutes is vital. If you're interested in history, episode two of the Home Space and Reason podcast is for you. Early on, there wasn't even such a thing as leisure time. Spending the leisure time we have in a different way can be a fulfilling journey. I mean, how fun is it to imagine what might fill you up? Did you know that as recently as 1940, over a third of houses didn't even have a flush toilet? Because of all our modern luxuries, we have much less work to do daily just to feed our family. Episode 2 is all about the history of homes and free time. Subscribe to this podcast so episodes automatically download when new ones are released. Join the private Facebook group called Home Space and Reason. The things I reference here, I post images of real time there, so the two go hand in hand. The group is also a great place to pose questions for me and chime in with like-minded people without the riffraff of the general Facebook population. If you enjoy this show, please write a review because it lets others know this is a good podcast and it's worth their time. If you've got feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at Christina with a K at spaceandreason.com. Thanks for sitting in on this conversation about creating a home that thrives. I'll meet you back here for the next episode. 